You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Welcome fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of St. Mark. Even though St. Mark is one of the four evangelists, he seems somehow to hide in the shadows of the Bible. He's not like St. Matthew, whom everyone knows was a Jewish tax collector. He's not like St. Luke, known as the artist and physician, who learned the tales of the Bible from the lips of the Mother of God. He's not St. John, the beloved apostle, who survived being boiled in oil and wrote the Apocalypse. He's not one of the Twelve Apostles, and has no taglines or identifying features, except that he is one of the four evangelists. Who is St. Mark? Here's what Abbot Garanger tells about him. Mark was the beloved disciple of Peter. He was the brilliant satellite of the Son of the Church. He wrote his gospel at Rome under the eyes of the Prince of the Apostles. The Church was already in possession of the history given by Matthew, but the faithful of Rome wished their own apostle to narrate what he had witnessed. Peter refused to write it himself, but he bade his disciple take up his pen and the Holy Ghost guided the hand of the new evangelist. In this succinct sketch, the Abbe tells us St. Mark's most important affiliation, St. Peter, and his vital mission. And that's a start. But who was the man? What was he like? Where was he from? How did he end up an evangelist? And where did he end up in the end? After a bit of searching, I was able to fill in some of the blanks with a handful of facts linked together with some scholars' guesses about today's saint. St. Mark is believed to have been born in Jerusalem and was the cousin of Barnabas, the disciple of St. Paul. He is known to have accompanied St. Paul and Barnabas on some of their journeys. He's generally cited as one of the 70 disciples sent forth by Christ. He was a fairly well-educated man, accounting for St. Peter's appointing him to pen the Gospels. St. Mark's mother, another Mary, but not one of the three at the foot of the cross, is known to have been one of the faithful women of the early church. According to Acts chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, after the angel led him out of Herod's prison, it was to Mark's mom's house that St. Peter fled. Mark is not recorded as having been personally called by Christ, but as having been converted by the Prince of the Apostles. When and where he met up with Peter, we don't know for sure, but there are several traditions suggesting possibilities. Some have suggested that Mark, who is believed to have been only a teenager at the start of our Lord's public ministry, followed Jesus initially because his mother was a follower of Christ. There is a school of thought that his mother became a follower because she was one of the caterers at the marriage feast of Cana and that she and Mark may have actually been the ones who filled the jugs with water that Jesus turned to wine. Some scholars believe that Mark's family owned an inn or kind of public house in which were located the upper rooms where the Last Supper, the first Mass, was celebrated. A tradition of the ancient Coptic church holds that it was St. Mark who hid the disciples in his house after the crucifixion and that it was his family home to which Jesus came after the resurrection, and where the disciples and the Blessed Mother received the Holy Ghost at the Pentecost. It is also widely surmised that St. Mark is speaking of himself when he tells of the young man who followed the arresting party with Jesus at the Garden of Olives, and who evades capture himself, only barely, leaving his toga behind when it's snatched off by the guards. One wonders the backstory of this episode, Had young Mark, still in his pajamas, followed Jesus and his apostles to the garden? Or had he gotten wind of Judas's treachery and followed the soldiers? I don't know about you, but I'm dying to know. It was Mark alone who records this side drama of the Passion, perhaps out of humility confessing his embarrassment and his fear, but perhaps he also wanted it known that he was present at this crux in history, the arrest of the Son of God. We have to plan on getting to heaven someday to ask him about all of this. What we do know for sure is that after the Pentecost, St. Peter took young Mark under his wing. When Peter moved to Rome, he took Mark with him and entrusted to him the writing of what became known to many as the Gospel of Peter. So obvious was St. Mark's work a dictation from the Bishop of Rome. 
but it was more than a word-for-word transcription that became the Gospels. Mark proved himself a loyal secretary, but also a canny observer of the events of Christ's life, adding personal details to Peter's dictation. Father Alban Butler says, It is to St. Mark that we owe the many slight touches which often give such vivid coloring to the gospel scenes, and help us to picture to ourselves the very gestures and the looks of our blessed Lord. It is he alone who notes that in the temptation Jesus was, quote, with the beasts, and that he, quote, slept in a boat on a pillow, that he, quote, embraced the children. He alone preserves for us the commanding words, Peace be still, by which the storm was quelled, or even the very sound of his voice, the Epheta and the Talitha Kumi, by which the dumb were made to speak and the dead to rise. So too the, quote, looking round with anger, and the, quote, sighing deeply, long treasured in the memory of the penitent apostle Peter, who was himself converted by his Savior's look. They are all here recorded by his faithful interpreter. After St. Mark finished his work on the Gospels, St. Peter continued to make good use of his friend, sending him to Aquileia, a Roman city at the head of the Adriatic Sea, then to Egypt, notably Alexandria and Antioch. In Alexandria, St. Mark founded one of the first and most important Episcopal sees. He began one of the first ever Christian schools and instituted what has been called the first seed of monastic life with what he called his therapeutes, the first desert monks, all groundbreaking accomplishments in the big picture of the infant church. Notice how, though, together with prayer and work, schooling is a common theme among the saints in all eras of the church. It helps to understand the importance that our bishops place today on establishing schools everywhere possible and in training not only holy priests, but capable teaching sisters. As all good bishops then and now, St. Mark somehow accomplished a million things at once in his daily life. He cared for his many wide-flung flocks throughout Egypt, distributed the sacraments near and far, mentored promising new priests, taught the young, found help for the sick, procured provisions for the poor, and preached to ever-growing crowds, converting souls everywhere he turned, and performing miracles. The New Testament world soon recognized St. Mark and Ezekiel, chapter 1, verses 1-21, through 21, by the symbol of a winged lion. A miracle that underlines this iconography occurred when St. Mark was walking near the River Jordan with his father, Aristopolis. A large and apparently hungry pair of lions appeared and began to size the men up. Preparing to attack them, they slowly circled, growling menacingly. Mark, with no small amount of trepidation, laid a hand on his father's arm, raised his eyes to heaven, and lifted his voice above the growling of the lions, which were every second moving closer. In Jesus' name, he prayed that he and his father be spared, and lowering his eyes at the sound of his father's gasp, he watched as both lions dropped down dead at their feet. A more homely little miracle with big repercussions came about through a common, ordinary chore. It seems St. Mark was limping around on a broken sandal, just putting up with it like saints tend to do, until a kindly follower took him, probably had to do some convincing, to one of the cobblers of Alexandria. This cobbler named Anianus may have seemed an anonymous choice at the time. His was the closest shop St. Mark could limp to, but there are no accidents in God's universe, especially when his dedicated laborers are involved. Somewhat nervous because he knew of the fame and controversy of the religious zealot in his shop, and because he was in a hurry to just be finished and move St. Mark along, Anianus slipped and cut his finger while repairing the sandal. Mark, sitting on a bench nearby, saw what had happened and, divinely inspired, picked up a piece of clay, spit on it, and applied the mixture to Anianus' finger, praying in Jesus' name for it to be healed. When the wound instantaneously healed, Anianus, in amazement and filled with grace, and curiosity, begged Mark to explain to him and his children about the Christian faith. 
His entire family was soon converted, and Anianus eventually became a bishop in the Egyptian church. As often happened in the early days, the success of St. Mark's mission in Egypt laid the groundwork for his martyrdom. The same successful preaching that inspired the conversion of countless souls also inspired the anger of the pagans of Alexandria. In 68 AD, after some 35 years laboring for the church, St. Mark was captured by enemies of Christ. He was beaten and thrown into prison, where tradition tells us he received the consolation of seeing a vision of Christ. The next day, fully recollected and at peace, Mark was taken into the public square, lassoed with a rope around his neck, and dragged to his death. It is said that Christian sailors, present at the scene of his death, miraculously came into the possession of St. Mark's broken body, which they brought back with great reverence to their home in Venice, where St. Mark's Basilica was raised to honor these relics. St. Mark is the patron saint of notaries and lawyers, and the patron against insect bites and diseases of the neck and the lymphatic system. Now, no discussion of the Feast of St. Mark would be complete without reminding everyone about the greater litany processions which are held every year on this day. As explained by Abbot Garanger in the liturgical year, quote, The Church breaks from the joy of the Easter season every March 25th to offer prayers of reparation. The vestments return for a moment to the violet of Lent. The Mass of the Stations, the Rogation Mass, is offered, and the faithful process outside the church while singing the litany of the saints. Unquote. It's a ceremony completely unrelated and yet somewhat related to the Feast of St. Mark. An ancient tradition of the church, this procession originates from the time before St. Gregory the Great, the 6th century, who added the procession permanently into the liturgical calendar on this day. The greater litanies are believed to have their roots in the ancient celebration of St. Peter's first entrance into Rome, which provides us a link back to St. Mark, slim though it might be. It may seem a little unfair to throw a wet blanket on Eastertide with a penitential exercise like this one, but as always, the Church has the wisdom of the Holy Ghost and the experience of centuries backing it up. Sort of the flip side of Laetare Sunday, when the Church brings out the pink vestments and incorporates a spirit of joy in the middle of Lent, Today's blessing and commemoration takes time during a period of plenty and ease to clean out the cellar and take stock of our stores, so to speak. The Church reminds us we should not be presumptuous or forgetful, even in our joy. It takes special care on this day to bless the crops for this upcoming season, something that is especially pertinent to us in these days of uncertainty about the food chain. And, in an era with such distress due to the vacancy of the chair of Peter, it behooves us all who are able to try to participate in the greater litany processions tomorrow, since it commemorates Peter, our first pope, taking his place in the See of Rome. What better way to honor the true papacy and to send to heaven our heartfelt petition for God's solution to the empty chair? In addendum, and this is only a pious practice we learned along the way, I believe from one of Maria von Trapp's books. Our family takes this day to bless the four corners of our property, bringing homemade crosses that we stake into the ground with small jars of holy water and a piece of blessed palm attached with ribbons. I'll have Kevin link below to the prayers that can be offered over the home, barns, outbuildings, our domestic animals, our pastures, meadows, and crops, as well as our orchards and vineyards. There is even a prayer to exercise dangerous animals such as venomous snakes and spiders, lice and ticks, and damaging insects. If you can have a priest come and do your house blessing, most especially, that is ideal, but these are still good and efficacious prayers offered by the father of the family. And a wonderful bit of Catholic culture, part prayer life, part hike, part craft project, that children remember with fondness, and that their angels most definitely smile upon and I feel sure God especially blesses. And one last addendum. Happy Blessed Feast Day to my husband, Daniel Mark, and to Bishop Mark Piverinus. St. Mark, pray for us all. <laughs>